Perfect. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for this uh, very nice conference. And uh, I would thank them twice for the invitation as well. I'm very honored to, to be able to give this talk now. So since uh, this is a bit uh, the, the rule, uh, I can say that uh, I, I've, I've known um, I did, but missed. I've known Gilles for uh, now 20 years this year. Uh, he, he was, uh, I was a master's student and I, I met him as a professor, I taught stochastic algorithm and limit theorems. And I have been just amazed at the pace at which it could lecture. It was tremendous for me, very, very fast. Okay, but, uh, like Emmanuel Gobet uh, said yesterday, ça rigolait pas. But afterwards, uh, in PhD uh, thesis, and then as, as a colleague, uh, I've uh, benefited from uh, the, the huge generosity of Gilles, uh, and uh, this is uh, very, very nice. And I have also had the opportunity to, uh, to collaborate, and it was very nice as well, and I hope we will be able to resume soon. Okay, so I'm going to speak about uh, uh, discretization issues about diffusion process with singular drift. And this is a joint work with uh, Benjamin Jourdain. Uh, no, this is you. With, uh, okay. Uh, with uh, in the audience as well, and will be the, the last lecturer of this conference. So what are we going to be interested in? We consider a diffusion process given by the dynamics in He. Okay, so it's a dri brain driven stochastic differential equation. It's in dimension D, it's not scalar. And we will focus on singular drifts, okay? Singular drifts because uh, we are going to consider drifts which belong to LQ, L row spaces, where the LQ and L row spaces are the usual Lebesgue spaces uh, that we end up with the norm uh, which appears here, the usual one with uh, obvious modifications in the case where Q, R, and rho would be infinity. And throughout the paper, we will consider the so-called Krilov and Reckner condition, which appears here, and which reads, which reads as d over rho plus two over q is smaller than one. So this is a very important condition. First of all, because it is the one under which Krilov and Reckner established the strong existence and uniqueness for this SD, okay? Second, the critical case when, the case, when this is equal to one, has been recently addressed by almost the same guys. And uh, I would like to stress as well that this condition appears in other fields of mathematics, like, for instance, fluid dynamics. If one uh, considers the Navier-Stokes equation, this condition is exactly uh, the celebrated Serin's criterion that uh, occurs when given a Lebre solution, one gets interested in knowing whether the solution is bounded or not. And this is exactly the, the provided some integrability holds for the solution. And this is exactly the condition that gives boundedness. So it is a, a condition which is somehow very natural and which appears in many applicative fields. Okay, so let us first try to give some hint. Where does this condition come from? So if you were asked to prove weak uniqueness for a weak existence, sorry, for this type of equations, the, the very intuitive uh, idea would, would say, well, I have a, an additive SDE, let's start applying, for instance, or trying to apply the Gerson-Hoff theorem, okay? And uh, this is exactly the, the good way to do, to use Gerson-Hoff and then provided a control of the type, indeed 1.1 holds. So B square, of course, it is the, the, the argument appearing in the Novikov condition, integrated in time, of course. And the fact that here we, we, we wish to obtain a small control in time, when T is small, would apply, in, would allow in some sense to apply the Ashminsky lemma to derive the exponential integrability needed in the Novikov criterion uh, using as well the Markov property. And throughout the, the, the speech, I, I, I will uh, use as well that J, G1 is the density of the brain and motion. And more generally, G with a small constant C will denote the uh, Gaussian density associated with a covariance matrix equal to, uh, C, uh, to C multiplied by the time uh, argument, okay? Okay, so where does the condition come from? It comes from Gaussian integrability. So roughly speaking, if you give yourself a function f in LQ prime 
L rho prime. So here we have a slight difference between, between what I, I first introduced, the krill of Fruckner or Serin condition, simply because obviously in connection with the Gerson of theorem, here we consider squares. So here I, I consider Q prime rho prime, which verify the integrability condition R. D over rho prime plus two over Q prime is strictly lower than two. So what do you do? You apply the older inequality. So of course we assume without loss of generality that both Q prime and rho prime are finite. So that what happens here, you have the spatial L rho prime. Uh, so uh, yes, L rho prime norm for the, the function itself. And here you have the, 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 the Gaussian density at the, the power associated to the conjugate exponent tilde rho prime is the conjugate exponent. And of course, here you increase the singularity because rho prime is greater than one. So you make appear the right normalization factor, which would be exactly SD over two. And when you take out what remains, you end up with S minus D over two rho prime. Well, okay. So you do it again in order to make precisely the LQ prime L rho prime norm appear. And this induces to a time singularity, which writes as minus D over two rho prime tilde Q prime, where again, tilde Q prime is the conjugate exponent associated with Q prime, okay? So the, the next question is when is this quantity finite? And of course, this quantity is finite provided this condition holds, which precisely happens under the previous integrability condition. So now going back to the Gerson of argument, in some sense, we, we just take a, a rho prime to be equal to rho over two, Q prime to be equal to Q over two, and we end up with this kind of control. I do apologize here, it's not alpha, it's, it's not alpha over two, it's alpha, uh, and that's it. But I, I, I did not want to bother uh, Vincent again uh, when I uh, get aware of that. So, but it does not change anything for what we, for the arguments we mentioned to apply. And I, I stress that, that we introduce a key quantity named alpha, which is the distance to the threshold, which is one minus two over rho plus two over Q. And what we will see in some sense, uh, and which is somehow the, the morality, both in the, in the free dynamics application or here, is that the integrability condition will actually provide some smoothness on the heat kernel associated with the diffusion, which in turn will give convergence and convergence rate for the approximation scheme. And because alpha will be up to the, the two factor, which is here, and this is why I got, uh, Mis, uh, misled exactly the convergence rate, okay? And again, keep in mind the, the, the creel of condition, which appears naturally, of course. So if we want then to, uh, to derive uh, weak, ex weak uniqueness or, weak, uh, or, or stronger uh, uniqueness, then there's additional work, but I hope it's clear at least for weak existence, okay? So just some motivations, again, we can say that such type of dynamics appear, for instance, in statistical mechanics, uh, when considering singular uh, interacting particle system, we can re refer to the works of Albeverio and his co-authors. It naturally appears when you consider, for instance, Biot-Savart type kernels of the form X divided by X over D, D being the dimension. So this is related to many phenomena, like in fluid dynamics again, or in the killer segel model. Of course, in those cases, there's an additional layer of convolution with respect to the law, which is somehow expected to smoothen the drift. But anyhow, these are kernels that are important to study and to consider and uh, to approximate. And what we would like to say is that uh, the previous Krilov and Rechner condition does not allow to consider exactly this kernel, but we are not that far. We can uh, uh, consider those kernels up to uh, an arbitrary small singularity, at least in dimension two. And also, uh, this is a, a model for investigating as well rougher drift, uh, which again appear in many applications. Again, uh, if we have in mind 3D uh, Navier-Stokes equation, we can mention the work of Zhang and Zhao, who established the existence of uh, a Lagrangian stochastic flow when the drift is, this is what we call a low resolution, so L infinity L2 and L2 H1 in dimension three, and that you have the additional structure condition that the divergence is zero. Of course, here the krilov fragner condition does not hold because D over rho, D over Q, so Q here is L infinity, D is three, rho is two, and three over two is greater than one, than one. okay? But uh, you have additional um, um, 
information which give that at least you have existence. So this is to say, anyhow, that it is important to approximate such an equation, right? How are we going uh, to uh, proceed? Uh, the, first, the first thing is that, of course, we are uh, dealing with unbounded drift. Unbounded drift. And uh, there are two different behavior of the drift, in some sense, in space and time. Here, in, in space, we have the Brennan motion, which gives a smoothing effect, OK? And it, sums, it, it, mean, it, it, uh, it is meaningful, in some sense, to consider uh, that, that we are going to, to, to define the, the, the scheme along the, 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 the special iteration and uh, uh, contrary to time that we are going to randomize, okay? But of course, in order to make it practical, we are going to truncate the drift. How to do so? Uh, how to do so? There are two ways to, to, that, that we addressed. I already emphasized the importance of this parameter, alpha over two, which will be actually the convergence rate associated to the schemes. And we can first consider a singularity related cutoff, singularity being uh, associated with this exponent, in the sense that we choose to cut off when the drift in space goes above h, h being, of course, the time step of the, uh, of the scheme at this precisely this exponent, okay? And in some sense, this is stronger we, 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 because this H is meant to be small. You see that the, this cutoff is stronger than the so-called scale-based cutoff, which would have consistent in uh, cutting off at H minus one over two. And this will allow in some sense to consider uh, what happened or, or to, to, to give controls associated with the first time step, okay? Uh, whereas uh, this, uh, for instance, for this cutoff, you say that we impose that it will uh, enter the scheme only after the first time step, once in some sense the Brownian motion will have itself create a density, okay? So it's just a bit technical and uh, okay. But anyhow, the, the, the key importance of that, the key importance of truncating is that because you want that when you are going to consider the, the transitions of the scheme, the drift, the effect of the unbounded drift must not prevail, must not dominate the Brownian, the magnitude of the Brownian increment. So both choices ensure that this feature will be respected. This is the key point that we wanted to have, okay? But as I said, of course, Brownian motion leads to some smoothing in space effects. This is, of course, not the, the case in time. We have no uh, a priori reasons to, to, to get smoother and smoother and in time. And of, because of the, of the B, there is no reason that this is, in some sense, point-wise defined. So this is why, in order to introduce our scheme, if we want to uh, keep any, uh, to avoid any smoothness, uh, co uh, condition on the, the, the time uh, component of the drift, we have to randomize time. We have to randomize time. And of course, we are going to consider random independent random variables UK, which are uniformly distributed on each time interval TK, TK plus one, because I'm sorry, I forgot to say that of course, TK is K times H, and right? the Kth uh, uh, discretization time. Okay, so this is the preliminary step about the drift. So once uh, we have introduced such a drift, we can consider the scheme, the singularity related scheme, which writes in the usual way for the Euler scheme, except that here we integrate, we, we introduce exactly the randomized time, okay? As usual and as uh, very practical for the, the writing, the, 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 and the error analysis, we as, as well introduce the continuous time interpolation of the schema. So here, and uh, from now on, I introduced TS tau, tau SH, which is the, the, the largest discretization time uh, before A, S, sorry. And the same, uh, the same scheme uh, would uh, be, uh, the, the same type of dynamics uh, could be written for the modified and scale-related cutoff. So this is the object which is going to approximate the initial uh, diffusion, right? Okay. 
so again, I, I do insist that for both schemes, the cutoff gives that for each time step, the drift is in some sense negligible with respect to the Brownian increment. So now, of course, to go further, we will need to analyze the, the behaviors of the schemes to, to say whether they enjoy some uh, density estimates, uh, Gaussian estimates, and how they can be related uh, one to the other, the density of the scheme and the density of the diffusion. Okay, so uh, usual, uh, let's first start indeed with the one step density, okay? For the scheme that is here, of course, from step to step, here I have a boundary drift, it's cut off, and I have a Gaussian transition, okay? So if I disintegrate, here I say, I consider I fixed TK, I fixed K, the corresponding TK, and I, I consider a T in TK, TK plus one, the density, the associated density, is the expectation of a Gaussian transition in which I insert the drift with the randomized time component, okay? So this obviously writes that way. And the point, the point which is very important, let's say for the, the singularity-based uh, cutoff, which is rewritten here, is that precisely uh, the exponential contribution, thanks to a convexity inequality, the, the exponential contribution of the drift will be negligible in the sense that, of course, uh, having uh, this in mind, uh, you precisely find that asymptotically, the, the, the drift on each time step does not give any contribution. And what does this mean as well? For fixed H, using a convexity inequality, you can upper bound the, the one step transition density by a Gaussian, a Gaussian transition, since you have get, you've got rid of the drift, bounded but explosive, but explosive in, in a way that it keeps, uh, it keeps, it keeps being controlled. So this simple, um, these simple computations readily give in some sense that the scheme admits a density. The, the Euler scheme admits a density. And as it would for a, even a, a Euler scheme with bounded coefficients, on each time step, you can upper bound this density by a Gaussian density. The point and the difficulty is to provide some non-exploding Gaussian bounds for the density, because even for the Euler scheme with bounded coefficients, if you do it naively, then you have a density which explodes when you iterate with constants that explode when you iterate the convolution. And to do so, you, you have to go a bit further in the analysis. And uh, this is what uh, we will uh, precisely do uh, thanks to uh, a Duhamel representation of the Duhamel type representation of the density, this means in some sense that we are expanding the density of the scheme around the density of the leading noise, the, 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 the Brownian perturbation. And there is a, a, a reminder term that needs to be analyzed, which involves the cutoff. And the, the, what we succeed in proving is that actually there exists a constant not depending on the time step, such that the density of the scheme is itself upper bounded by a Gaussian density. Uh, here we have as, as well fixed any constant C strictly greater than one. So we are uh, able to bound the density of the scheme by the Gaussian density whose variance is arbitrarily close to the variance of the Brown motion and a constant C which does not depend on the time step. If we uh, go further with the analysis, we can as well derive, and this will be a key quantity appearing in the error, that we can actually control the spatial Hölder modulus of the density with respect to the forward variable and uh, establish that actually this density behaves just as the Gaussian density, because this is the usual and typical sensitivity control you would have uh, for uh, the, the Brownian density itself. So the morality of uh, this first proposition is that the, the scheme that we have introduced enjoys properties which are very, very similar to the one of the Brownian motion. In some sense, even though the, the drift is unbounded, potentially singular, it does not affect some properties in law in the sense that the density, the, the, the density of the scheme keeps being upper bounded by a Gaussian law, okay? So this is what happens concerning, concerning the scheme. So, okay. Okay, so a possible way uh, to, from the previous estimates, a possible way to proceed 
is to let h go to zero and derive identifying the limits, uh, justifying properly that the Euler scheme indeed tends to the, the, the diffusion, that the, the same controls hold for uh, the diffusion itself. Huh? So here we denote by gamma the diffusion of x. Of course, uh, under the Krilov and Rector condition, we already know that for almost any t, the, uh, then the, the diffusion itself admits a density. Here we specify and say that for all t, xt has, admits a density, which enjoys a, a Gaussian amper bound and those kind of Gaussian controls. So again, it means that the drift, even, sing, even uh, if singular, does not perturb too much the, the, the behavior of the diffusion in some sense. And as well, you have the similar type of duamel representation. The density of the diffusion can be expanded around the density of the Gaussian time of perturbation. So here, uh, this is some sense just the difference of the generators between the brand motion and the diffusion. Okay, so for this density, we have even more controls and this uh, uh, can be derived following uh, an approach we developed with uh, Antonello Pesce and uh, Xi Zhang. Um, following a discussion we had uh, with Gilles, and I thank him uh, warmly for that again. Okay, so again, uh, those bounds specify the Krilov bound because the Krilov bound uh, gave that for the diffusion. I stated it for the Brownian density, but Krilov and Ragnar established that the same control in some sense hold for the, the diffusion with singular drift itself, and the Krilov and Ragnar control meant that uh, integrated against a, a function in LQ prime, L rho prime, the density behaved as a Gaussian density. We go a bit further in the sense that we just prove that the, the density is upper bounded by the density, which by a Gaussian density, which of course gives this result back, but it's, uh, it's stronger. Okay, so what is our main theorem? It concerns the, the convergence rate for the Euler-Maruyama scheme. Uh, when uh, we consider this type of approximation. So again, alpha is the distance to the singularity, the gap to the threshold in the krill of Ragnar condition, fixed a constant C greater than one, there exists a constant itself depending on C, such that uh, the difference between the density is upper bounded by H alpha over two. And unfortunately here we have some reminder terms, a logarithm uh, reminder terms, which are mainly technical, but uh, that's life. Huh? And again, JC, GC, sorry, stands for the Gaussian density associated with uh, covariance matrix C U I of T. Okay, so once again, the integrability gives the smoothness. The smoothness is what we read on the heat kernel. Uh, integrability reads here. Huh? This is smoothness in older uh, forward variable. And in terms, this time of smoothness will lead to convergence rate, okay? So, sorry, uh, I, will, I will manage. Okay, so let's do now a detour to the weak error analysis and try to give the intuition of how this result can be proved. So I will consider, for instance, in this paragraph that this is a so-called abstract diffusion with additive noise and XH, it's Euler scheme in the sense that I do not specify anything on the drift now. I would like to emphasize what is the usual ap uh, approach to weak error analysis. And the point is to consider the associated Feynman Katz PDE, the parabolic PDE associated, because provided the solution to FK exists and is smooth enough, and given a test function phi, which can in some sense, and in some cases, even be a direct mass, which is precisely the case we considered before for our convergence result, the point is to say, well, uh, this goes back to the seminal uh, paper of uh, Talley and Pumbara. Uh, the, the point is to expand locally uh, to, to say, well, this difference can be uh, represented as a telescopic sum of the solution to the PDE, apply Ito's formula. So of course I have a difference because when I apply Ito's formula, the, 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 the dynamics of the scheme is frozen on each time step. So if I want to make the PDE appear, uh, I have this difference here. So of course, this term vanishes because it satisfies the PDE, and I'm led to consider here a difference of the coefficient time a gradient, okay? So this is, in a nutshell, what weak error is about and how it is usually investigated. So if B and U are smooth, iterating this type of Ito approach, one gets that the error is of order H with respect to the time step, right? 
So now, uh, and of course, this is the, the, the paper I already mentioned, and there is a huge associated literature. You can uh, quote, for instance, the works of Bali and Talley in the high quality framework, Kon Konakoff and Maman, uh, who, who used a more uh, PDE-based uh, technique. Okay, but usually when everything is fine, the, the, the weak error has older age. But short after the, the, the seminal works by, by Talley and Tubaro appeared, uh, Another literature we consider rough coefficients because in 91, Mikulevicius and Platon said, well, what happens if B are, for instance, uh, in older spaces? In older spaces, uh, with the usual notation for older spaces, so this is the time older regularity, and this is the space older regularity. You consider that phi is C2 plus gamma for gamma in 0, 1, and then you can appeal to the parabolic theory uh, for instance, developed by Friedman or Ladizenskaya, Solonikov, or Alceva, which give that U is smooth. Uh, roughly speaking, the, the, the smoothness under those assumptions, the smoothness of the initial condition is preserved. And in particular, the gradient is bounded. So from this expression, if you know that the gradient is bounded, you take the supremum out. And what happens here? You take the elder modulus of B, you use the elder modulus of B to get this kind of difference. And then you have the modulus continuity of the brown motion in some sense, and you get something like h over gamma over two, okay? So this is the, the work of Mikulevicius and Platon. We used usual uh, results from PD theory, and we can refer to a work with Konakov to go to the density and uh, to the work by uh, Nufel Frika, uh, who also consider this kind of uh, assumptions for skew, for skew diffusion. But of course, the, 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 the true question is what happens if we lose any smoothness of the coefficient? Okay, which is precisely the case when we're dealing with singular drift in LQ or even with bounded drifts, for instance, okay? The point is to say, well, if I have no smoothness on the coefficient, I have still the, uh, the, the, the key property that the law will have some smoothness. This is the, 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 uh, so the point is, when no smoothness on the coefficient, shift the thing to the law. How does this work? Uh, this is still the expression of the error, so now we are going precisely to make the, the, the law appear. So still telescopic, telescopic sums. Here we have the, the, the cutoff drift and here the, the usual drift. So we, we introduce here the difference of the gradients, okay, which precisely allows to make here the difference of the law appear against the, the cutoff drift multiplied by the gradient. So here you feel, indeed, uh, you feel that you will have the sensitivity of the law of the scheme that will play a role uh, to control the, the, the difference. And then eventually remains a cutoff error, okay? So this is in some sense what can be done in order to uh, investigate the error when no smoothness is available, okay? So again, in, in green, we see the sensitivity. So, okay, sorry. Taking formally phi equal to delta y, the Dirac mass at fixed point y in the previous expansion, uh, provided everything is meaningful, which is indeed the case in, under the assumptions we considered, we have that the difference of the density writes in the following way. So of course, the, the difference of the gradient become, uh, becomes the difference of the fundamental solution, of the gradient of the fundamental solution. Here we, again, uh, this is the, the, the green term, uh, gradient of the diffusion density in the backward space variable here, uh, because we have the difference uh, between the discretization, pay, the discretization uh, step and um, the, the current time. We have the sensitivity of the Euler scheme of the density in the forward time variable, uh, which already appeared and was investigated. And then we have a truncation error. So I, I must uh, uh, say that this ID had been uh, already used by uh, Umema Benchek and Benjamin Jourdain in the L infinity case, when Q is equal to rho is equal to infinity. They considered the total variation distance. This means roughly speaking that you add another integration layer and this allowed them to avoid the additional logarithmic factor that we add in that case and to have a clean one over two upper bar, okay? And, uh, but this, this key ID was already used by uh, Umeima and Benjamin. And I think this is the expansion which gives the clearer approach to the error analysis, but it is not the one we used. It is not the one we used. It is possible, but it is suboptimal. We mentioned, we, we managed with Benjamin to get any uh, order bar alpha 
strictly lower than the threshold we uh, indicate. Okay? And this is due mainly because we have some restriction here when we consider the sensitivity of the diffusion density. So indeed, here we developed the density of the scheme around the density of the diffusion. We could have chosen to develop each of the quantities around a Gaussian law, which is itself smoother. And this is what we did actually for the error analysis. And this is what leads to the optimal bounds we stated before. Okay, which is precisely, again, the gap to the singularity huh? times the, 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 the scaling of order one half. Okay. Uh, so now I, I will try to conclude uh, giving some hints about how these heat kernel bounds are derived for the diffusion, not for the scheme, but for the diffusion because it's easier. The scheme is essentially, uh, the, the, the controls for the scheme are essentially proved the same way, but it's more technical. So, uh, and this is precisely uh, what uh, we developed uh, with my co-authors uh, following uh, discussions with Gilles. So let, let's smooth everything. So let's assume that B epsilon is a C infinity with compact support approximation of B, okay? And uh, so that we have this type of convergence and uh, define XT epsilon to be this dynamics. So of course, here we have a, a brilliant diffusion with bounded coefficients. So it is well known from your favorite technique, either the parametrics, either the Maliavan calculus, whatever you want, that XT epsilon admits a density, gamma epsilon, which enjoys Gaussian bounds. Gaussian bounds, of course, with a constant here, which depends on epsilon. Importantly, the concentration is independent of, of epsilon. And this is, can be intuitively seen uh, from a Dremel type formula. Uh, the concentration is the Gaussian one, but of course the explosion associated to this possible approximation is, uh, is here. Our goal is to prove that there exists a constant which is independent of epsilon for which the same type of uh, control holds. Of course, here uh, X theta is a multi-index uh, and, and we, we go up to a finite multi-index, okay? So what is the, the, the point? Again, we, we can write a type of Duhamel expansion. And here, in some sense, we do something which, which, could, be, uh, which could seem very uh, adventurous and very weird and uh, very uh, dangerous, but uh, you just have to trust, to, to, be, uh, to, to be faithful. You introduce F epsilon S, which is the supremum over X and Z of gamma epsilon, the density, divided by GC. The goal, of course, is to, to prove that this quantity is bounded, okay? So what you know precisely, the, the, the regularization step, precisely allows you to say that this quantity is finite. Possibly depends on epsilon, but is finite. And this is the preliminary step to apply a Granval volterra type argument, which will indeed lead to uh, the boundedness of this function. So indeed, if we normalize, we normalize on both sides by the Gaussian density, which will serve or which we want to serve as an upper bound, we end up with that. Here, we have the function we want to bound. And now the point is that for this integral, we are considering Gaussian computation. So we have the, 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 the semi-group property, we have everything which is quite nice and explicit. And which tells you that if you apply all those inequality and the, the convolution properties of the Gaussian kernels, then you will exactly end up uh, with uh, something like that. On, on the left-hand side, you keep that. And here you add, it's precisely as we did before with the, the when I tried to give a hint of where the, the integrability threshold came out, you see that when you apply all those inequality, in space, you have a factor D of a true row appearing. Here you have an additional one half because in the GML formula, you had already a gradient, okay? But here you are almost done because, okay, tilde Q is again, as before the, the conjugate exponent. So here you can then take the supremum over X and Y, perfect. And you, you are almost in a, in a situation to conclude because F epsilon here, F epsilon here, Integrable singularity precisely because of the Krilov and Rector condition. Here you have a tilde Q. Well, this means that up to an additional convexity inequality if tilde Q is different than one, you will be done. This is what we do precisely. And we establish something like that, okay? F epsilon S T to the tilde Q. So we have here bounded co components. And here 
we have something which is really uh, in, in, in the shape of a Grandval Volterra type argument, which precisely leads to the existence of a constant which independently from epsilon gives an upper bound for the density associated with the uh, compact support approximation of a singular drift. The, 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 the strength of this approach in some sense is that you can repeat that on the gradient because you see here, of course, the, the, the Krilov and Rockdale condition the, the, comes from this type of exponent in red, huh? which appears here. Going to the gradient, we would add a singularity of order one half in the blue term, but the integrability condition remain. So this means that the same reasoning can be done with the gradient replacing the blue term here by one half plus two over two rho. And then once you have those uniform bounds, of course you need an additional uh, smoothness analysis, which is too technical and involves a really heat kernel types argument with diagonal and off diagonal cuttings and so on. To, to, to have some other property of the gradient in order to apply compactness arguments like the Ascoli theorem and identifying the limit, then you will derive the bar. Okay? So this is a somehow simple and robust method to derive uh, heat kernel bounds, even for singular drift, when you are considering a regime which uh, gives you good convolution properties and stability and, and global behavior. Okay? So uh, let me conclude with some possible extensions. So a natural question is, well, you considered uh, an additive drift. What about the multiplicative drift? So there are a few points to be discussed here. Let's first assume that the drift itself is, uh, in, uh, is homogeneous, does not depend on time. Okay, and of course that it is uniformly elliptic bounded, provided it is, it is Lipschitz to make things simple, a Lipschitz diffusion coefficients will make the second order term in some sense homogeneous to the drift, okay? And in that case, we can fully expect that the previous techniques will adapt. Huh? This is exactly in some sense what Zong did. And he actually concerned, he actually considered drift which were in LQ uh, of W1 uh, P in space, okay? Uh, this is exactly the, the, the integrability condition on the gradient of the drift. This is the homogeneity, the, the, the analogy between the drift and the second order term. <coughs> there is a technical difficulty for, uh, as far as the numerics is concerned, is that uh, if we do not assume any uh, smoothness on T, it's not clear how to proceed to the, random, the randomization. Okay, so this is an additional difficulty. The properties I mentioned allow as well to say, well, this approach should work as well if we go, for instance, to isotropic gamma stable processes. And we could state following, because the Gaussian computations we did can be uh, extended to the stable case, to the rotational invariant stable case, which gives a, a well understood, oh, sorry. This means that it, no, it's cyclic. No, it's not cyclic. It's not cyclic. Okay, sorry for that. Uh, the, the rotationally invariant uh, stable process, which gives a, a well understood and well behaved uh, asymptotic um, uh, description of the, the, the long jump, the large jumps, sorry, in some sense. Uh, so here we, we, we would get that for, for stable driven SDEs, uh, we would have an, an uh, error order of type alpha over gamma, where bar P is in some sense what lower and upper bounds a stab, an isotropic stable density. This is known, for instance, from the work of Zolotarev or in 1D or by uh, Kolokoltsov and many others in, uh, in the general multidimensional case. And the, 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 the threshold would write in, in this way. Of course, we have continuity with respect to the stability index, with respect to what we presented before. Okay. And uh, the other question remaining is, of course, and it can be seen here as well, when you're close to the integrability threshold, the convergence rate collapses. Okay, so uh, if, you, if you go uh, into the critical case, this will not work. And this opens the, uh, the, the field to many uh, future questions uh, concerning possibly distributions, what can, what, has, what can be done for distributions, or even in the critical case. And uh, I think I will thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.